Welcome to Teal Talk, a podcast brought to you by the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. That's O-A-E-S-V for short. We're your hosts, Taylor and Lori. In each episode, we speak with professionals in the field to dive deep into the intersectional issues that affect survivors in Ohio. Before we begin, we want to give a content warning that we will be discussing sexual violence and other issues that may be upsetting and triggering. If you need help, please feel free to call our resource line at 888 888- 886-8388 during regular business hours or the Ohio Sexual Violence Helpline 24-7 at 844-644-6435. Please take care of yourself. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Teal Talk. I'm your host today, Lori Hamami, the Resource and Communications Coordinator at the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. We took a little podcasting break in August, so today's episode feels very fitting. We're going to be focusing on all things self-care. I'm in the studio with another OAESV staff member, Natasha Larson, and the amazing Tekka Thompson, to discuss the OAESV self-care retreat that was hosted in July. Before we begin, I'd love to introduce you to both of our guests today. Natasha Larson has been working in the anti-violence movement for 14 years. Her passion has always been to help strengthen communities through education, outreach, and advocacy. She began her career as a shelter advocate for a dual domestic violence rape crisis center And from there, her work evolved into providing comprehensive sexuality education and outreach. Her experience in education and advocacy allowed her to move into program coordination and management, where she helped design and maintain two new anti-violence organizations, the Ohio Sexual Violence Helpline and the Ohio Health Trauma Recovery Center. Now she has the pleasure of serving as the Director of Training and Member Engagement at OAESV, where she works closely with two incredible teammates, Elle and Jay Vaughn, in developing training content for the state of Ohio. Hello, Natasha. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. What an honor to provide trainings and create trainings for an entire state. Absolutely. And we also have Tekka. Tekka Thompson has been a youth program director who has spent the last 30 years in public service. Now she's stepping forward to use her leadership skills and gifts as a storyteller and facilitator to lead women of color on their own personal journey of discovering and igniting their purpose. She is a certified yoga nidra guide with training in somatic movement, somatic stress release, and community storytelling. She believes rest and connection to the body bring deep restorative healing. Welcome, Tekka. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Well, as I mentioned, today we're just going to be chatting about the OAESB self-care retreat that we hosted in July. So I'm just going to open the floor and let you two start off with all the talking because I can't wait to hear about how it went. Thank you so much, Lori. I would love to just give a little context and then pass it over to Tekka. OAESB has had this tremendous opportunity to be able to host two self-care retreats. And so before the one in July, we were able to launch this fully under Tekka's tutelage and be able to host one in October 31st, 2022 at Mohican Lodge. And it was called Laugh, Dance, Rest, a Collective Healing Experience. Tekka, do you have any thoughts from that previous one or any thoughts on how that went? It was an amazing experience, but first of all, I just want to lift up that commitment to collective care that comes from Rosa and the leadership is just amazing, and it was just an amazing opportunity to be able to create that retreat. It was important for the leadership that their staff wasn't involved in the planning, so they could also kind of dip in and experience some of the the goodness of collective care. The retreat was just dope. It was amazing. It was really fun. (laughs) It was good. People had a great time, but 
you know, I just really want to lift up the commitment that comes from leadership to provide a space for the folks who are boots on the ground to just come and, you know, take in some time to resource themselves, to connect with other people who are doing the same work. So it's just like really cutting edge. And also it just shows that collective care can be sustainable when we put in like policy and when we say, hey, we are going to set aside this money to do it. And I think Ohio, especially the Ohio Alliance in Sexual Violence is really just kind of leading the way, like, let's do this. We believe in it. It's a part of who we are. And so, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about the first retreat. I just felt it was so important for us to honor that that's where we came from. And it was all Tekka. It was all the facilitation, all of the back and forth with the facility. And so now fast forward to two years later, I have this opportunity to take on some of that leadership from an event management, but I knew there was no way we could do it without Tekka. So she was the first person that I tagged into this. And I said, let's go, let's figure out how we do this again. And so I learned a lot from her along the process. And we were able to host this for two days rather than one day, which was such an honor um, to be able to take more space, more time, not only hosting workshops, but also giving people the space to walk the land, to really just like be in space with one another. So it was really special. It was. Natasha and I kind of had this conversation about like, you know, what part do you want to play this year? And it just turned out so perfect. I also love the fact that they kind of decided that you know, it's best if we give two days, right? So now we have to shift some things around a little bit. But I I think that was important because it oftentimes takes people more than one day to really land in their bodies. It just all worked out very beautifully. So again, the commitment to and the intentionality about this retreat, it's remarkable. Like, you know, it should be something that we should be celebrating. Like, it's not just something we did. This is like something that should be highlighted for other states to see, you know, how are we promoting collective care? Because it is important because this work is really hard (laughs) Um, and, and and it brings folks to it that want to give their all, all the time. And so acknowledging that we see folks are working hard and we understand that they are oftentimes like putting everything that they have into their work and honoring that with a day or two to say, just come and rest, right? Come rest, come laugh, come dance, come quilt, you know, do all the things. So do all the things, come do all the things with us and we'll take care of you. I like that you're mentioning this commitment, Tekka, because one day is a commitment, but how do you really show commitment? Let's do it for two days. Um, And you're right. Like when people walk into a space, especially if it's their first time doing something or they're like, what is this going to entail? Like that first day, they might be feeling like a little bit nervous. You know, what's going to happen? Am I going to like talk to people? I'm feeling kind of shy. But then by day two, you're like, okay, I did this. I know what to expect and I can fully be present and like in my body. So really, really cool that it was able to be offered for two days. Before we continue, I just kind of want to jump back a little bit. Can you two share what exactly this retreat was? Like who was it for and what were the aims or the goals? That's a great question, Lori. At the office, when we were chatting about the planning, it was like, oh, this is like an advocate retreat. Like that became the buzzword, but we really wanted to pause and make sure that this retreat was known that it could be for any staff who were working at an anti-violence organization because we recognize that each of our rape crisis centers are designed a little bit differently. Some have really large staff, some have really small staff, some folks are wearing multiple hats. Sometimes you're grant writing and then also meeting with a client. So we wanted to make sure that we were offering a space of rest for any of our rape crisis centers doing this work. So we intentionally sent out invitations through directors because our goal also was, can we see if we can get at least one person from each center? Because sometimes we recognize that some folks may have larger budgets to be able to send folks, but we also try to make sure to remove some of those cost barriers as well. So I worked with some directors just to see if we could have some staff sent. And we had a really great turnout from a large portion of our centers, which was beautiful. And some folks were able to send more than one person, which really was great because then we got to see some bonding between teams 
teammates that was just happening organically. Some people had worked together for a really long time. Some people were new staff like with each other. And so this gave like a really cool space for them to even just like bond with their teammates. But the goal, right, was to say, you all are doing direct service. And so let us give this gift of rest to you. So we designed workshops along the line of collective care. Each piece was really intentional. And that was a lot of Tekka's design. I made sure that every facilitator I connected with knew that that was the theme. And we had that conversation, regardless of if we were having a conversation on mending towards repair, quilting and restorative justice principles, or dance vibes and exploration. Everything tied together of this. We are here to lean on one another and to take care of one another. I hope that answered your question. (laughs) Sometimes I get in the weeds and I'm so excited. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, When we say collective care, sometimes people think, oh, we're just coming together. And that's the collectiveness that we're just coming together to have yoga, right? (laughs) But really to kind of tie the theme of what collective care really means and how it is that we engage one another and how it is that we tend to one another as the collective um, in a way that we're resourcing ourselves with these practices to go back and collectively take care of the community. So we really met a couple of times about, yeah, let's make sure that everyone we are bringing in um, and that all of the uh, facilitators understand that this is kind of the goal that's running behind the scenes, right? Um, And to be honest with you, I think it turned out beautifully. I think it just, I feel like collectively we felt like we were in that space together and it wasn't just a bunch of separate little workshops or separate little experiences. It was an entire collective experience. I agree. It felt that way to me. And I think it's also really reflected in some of the feedback, but really people said that there was intent, that the overall vibe was great, that everyone was friendly and came together and that we had a combination of nurturing and relaxation I love this quote. I can tell everyone in the room genuinely cared for each other and the work that we do daily. So to be in an authentic space where there was care is just what a joy. You mentioned the title shifting from advocate retreat to self-care retreat, but I'm also hearing a lot of language in this discussion about collective care, um, collective self-care. Can you just chat a little bit about that, like specific nuance? And if this retreat was a self-care retreat, that focused on collective care or if there was space for both? Oh gosh, this is such a great question. And I love it because we really got way down in the weeds with the nuance of, okay, what is self-care versus collective care? And really what is collective care, (laughs) right? Because there's like a couple of definitions that are floating around out in the world about what collective care is. And this is the world according to me is that, our self-care, especially with organizations that are giving to the community and helping the community and supporting the folks that are doing that work, our self-care truly, if we're decolonizing our self-care, is really in benefit to the collective, meaning the work we do we take care of the community as a collective, our organization. So each person that is tending to their self-care in a way that is um, resourcing comes back to the organization, the collective, in a way where they can continue to do this work, right? And so self-care then is not about this capitalistic thing. It's not commodified where we're like, going to get facials. Now, facials can be self-care, but it's not about, um, let me build myself up so I can go grind myself down again, right? So, because a lot of times that's what, that's what self-care is perceived to be. Like, I'm going to take two days off and go do these things so that I can go back to work and just pound myself back into dust for the next 40 hours. Whereas if we're looking at it from this perspective that the agency is the collective and we're just a part of the ecosystem, right? And that when we take care of ourselves, it's in service to the work that we do in a generous way, in a generative way. Like 
I'm coming back to feed the ecosystem because I know that if one part of the ecosystem is not well, then we all suffer. Um, and so we really kind of played around with that concept and threw it out on the first day and um, just kind of let people chew on it a little bit. And then the goal of the retreat was to help them experience that. I hope that made sense. <laughs> yes, I'm just absorbing it all. <laughs> And Tekka, to build on that, I feel like you built that container so well for people to be collective and join and care for one another. And we started to see it with other folks who were attending. One person shared that they had some really intense stuff happening at home. And I saw people who did not work with them around them gathering and holding space for them to process and to share grief. We also had some situations with like dining and so some issues with like waiting for food and things like that and I literally saw people like feeding other people because there was a wait for food and so everybody embodied it yeah so on so on day one we kind of just started by setting this container of that it's actually an ecosystem right we're all a part of the larger collective that's going out to care for people so we kind of set that container. And then on day two, we came back with some, some conversations around, like, how do we embody this? Like, how do we live this? And then even how do we embody collective care? So our self-care is in service to the collective. And then how do we embody this, even if we work in an organization that only has face time? for self-care and collective care. So they'll say it's important, but you know they're still kind of not really um, embracing it all the way from the top to the bottom. And so, and that just feels really gross in the body when someone says, oh, we believe in self-care, but then they want you to work 45 hours <laughs> or, you know, you know what I'm saying. But anyway, so we had conversations about what could it look like? The session that I led in day two was, my favorite session because we got to kind of envision what could collective care actually look like in our organizations from the top meaning like how can we create space in our day-to-day -day work that brings in a form of collective care how can we like change our processes and policies to say collective care matters and then if that doesn't work, how do we tend to one another within an organization that is only giving face time to self-care and collective care? Because I believe that collective care is also how we tend to one another. And it's, it can be very healing in those actions. And so um, we opened up day two in that way um, to kind of just give people some things to take with them when they leave? What could this look like back at work when I leave this retreat? So I'm guessing there were many fruitful, inspirational <laughs> discussions, um, but I'm sure there was also a lot of time for laughter and play because if you, I mean, whenever I'm in a room full of advocates, I know that we're always going to be laughing together. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to see a lot of joy, which was beautiful. Um, even just people sitting at breakfast with one another, telling jokes and things like that. And sitting again, sitting with people that maybe you don't know, having that two days really helped as well to see like people shift and move and chat with somebody else. And um, I'm thinking back to like some of the workshops in particular, but um when we were like designing our own gender affirming coloring book, right. And, and sharing stories with one another about like experiences we had while some of those, it's like they were because we live in a very patriarchal society, gender norms are very rigid, but we also then got to play with one another outside of those structures and build messaging that was so powerful and be like, yay, imagine if we gave this to our younger selves and now think of all the young people we get to give this to. It was very beautiful and lots of laughter and lots of fun and thinking about big things and how they can shift in our society. I got to participate in the Dance Vibes and Exploration, uh, which is beautiful because many folks, I think, are intimidated when they hear something about a dance class. They're like, well, I didn't take ballet. I didn't do this. And so we really tried to say, no, bring your full self, your full body and explore what it means to hear this rhythm in yourself. And there was laughter. There was fun. There was shaken a little. And it was great. It was so much fun. And I don't think many people normally would think I would do this with a colleague, but it really truly then became to like remove the barriers that sometimes we put up. I think when we employ with people and just know that they're 
full human beings and get to see this part of them outside of the nine to five. So there was lots of fun and joy as well as really like deep moments of breath and, and reflection. Yeah, really what happened uh, during those two days where all of these amazing spaces were created, where people could come and like Natasha said, just bring their whole body, their whole experience, exhale and look around and say, okay, it is, this is okay to play. It's okay to laugh. It is completely okay to be vulnerable in this space um, because what happened and uh, Natasha and I had talked about like creating a space where folks could, could talk about grief. And we kind of were like, after we went back and forth with, we decided, um, no, let's not do that. So we created a space for a resiliency pause. Yeah. But what happened was when I showed up, I had, I was dealing with some significant grief myself. And because we are modeling, bring your whole self, you know, bring all of that here. Um, so we talked about my grief and how I was able to be held collectively in the community that we were cre creating there at the retreat. And by day two, people were opening up about their own grief in a really healthy way. Um, and in my second session on day two, I had some people who wanted to come and talk specifically about grief, even though it wasn't a grief space. But I'm only bringing this up, like Natasha said, about the dance class where people were able to just fully bring themselves and open up. And like she said, there were moments when people were able to take some deep breath because there were a lot of people there processing a lot of things. And we created this space where people felt safe enough and comfortable enough to reach out and take whatever it was that they needed. If they needed to move their bodies and dance, they went over there. If they wanted to talk more a little bit about some things that were ouchy or just have some space to be still and process collectively, all of that was available to them. So again, I think that it wasn't just a series of little workshops that we said, here, go, go to this. Um, each session, people were really able to embody what we were trying to provide for them throughout this experience. Yeah, I love what you said, Tekka. And that reminded me that there was something in the water or in the air or something earlier that week, because we had a lot of folks who came up to me and said, I didn't think I was going to make it. I honestly thought there was a lot going on. I was just going to blow it off. And then as soon as I got here, I'm so glad that I did. And as soon as I got to speak with other people, I'm so glad that I was here. So I'm so glad that we were able to hold that space, especially when so many people had so many heavy things work-wise and personally going on, and that it still felt like a good space to be in. That was really a, a huge honor. And then another thing that came up that I, I didn't really think about, but one of the intentionalities that we built in was that we knew that some folks wanted to move their body. We knew that some folks wanted to be collectively chatting with one another about things, but we also knew some people are also more quiet contemplative, more artsy craftsy, like something to do solo. And I remember sitting in the space that we did uh, where we were quilting and talking about restorative justice. And when we reflected back, what were some of the things that you were thinking about? Someone said, it was just so nice to like build something with my hands and to not think, to go offline a little and to really have that space for rest and creativity and to like move our bodies in a way that we don't do. It's not this big, huge dance all the time, but even just the act of putting a stitch in and things like that with intentionality was really helpful for people. Yep, for sure. And I, again, I'm going to say this one more time that I think the Ohio Alliance and sexual violence is really like setting the model that other states should be like, wait, how are they doing that? It's not just that we are creating a self-care retreat. There's so much intentionality around what we're doing to help people you all know, well, maybe you don't, but I've been with you all for a couple of times that I really believe that we teach people that you embody self-care. So you become your own self-care. You become your own self-care. So a yoga class is great. A breath class is great. But in the heat of the moment, people need to be able to know and be confident in accessing their own body 
in order to regulate their nervous system. Um, and so that's really what we were doing, like creating all these spaces for people to experience all of these things so that they can learn that they are actually their own resource for self-care, right? Even though we're coming together collective. And again, that's how it ties in self-care, collective care. Like we've given you all of these beautiful things that you can play around with and go home and have so that we can keep our collective efforts moving forward because there are a lot of families or a lot of people that we need to hold space for and it is a lot of work so if quilting is your thing honey go quilt get your quilt on right (laughs) move your hips then like we're showing you that it's not like this thing that you should be afraid of put some music on and dance it out and then come back to your agency ready resource and then also knowing how to um, when i'm not feeling resource like who is a safe person here that understands that we're a collective how can i tap into hey natasha i need a second right (laughs) like this is happening to me this is what's going on and i understand now that co-regulation is powerful like can we take five minutes just to tap in so that i can go back and to my office to my desk and be the best person that i can be um in this moment i think there is so often this mental divide between personal and professional life you know you go to work the people at work know this one version of you and then when you get home you can hang up your tie and like (laughs) take off your um, work suit and quote unquote, finally be yourself or finally take this breath of fresh air. This idea of a retreat during the work week really is a radical way of being like, we can actually be ourselves and practice community and self-care like in a quote unquote work environment with coworkers. So what you said, Natasha, about like this idea of experiencing this with colleagues, that mental divide of professional and personal life, we're really like, blurring the lines there in a positive way. I believe that the lines should be very blurred. Like we show up to work when we have bumper rails, like there, we just can't show up to work any type of way, but we certainly should be able to show up to work as ourselves, right? That really is how we decolonize like our spaces of work is when we can show up authentically and then our spaces of work are places where we can express ourselves authentically and be vulnerable without repercussions, yep. right? It's not like we're just coming to work and like <laughs> every day is just self-care day all day long. But the idea is that we create spaces at work that are kind yes. where we can yes. We understand that in order for Tekka to be the best Tekka that she needs to be, that sometimes she needs to take a break and say, wait a minute, I need to gather myself, right? And this is who I am, right? You know, just being able to bring as much as yourself to work as you can. And that was me before I retired. And I'm telling you that it is not always the easiest space because I was always fighting to show up as me and you know i was always considered to be too loud you talk too much you you want too much (laughs) you do too much (laughs) you know um i have a late diagnosis with adhd so i'm also sometimes a little messy with things right like you know and it's like you're messy you know like sometimes your thoughts don't make sense but hey guess what y'all this is me (laughs) right So I believe that we should be able to show up the way that we can in service to work, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, we're just not going to come in there and you won't take me as I am. And, you know, all of that. We have to understand that that's not what we're going for. But, you know, just a space enough where you can feel like if I need to be my most authentic self, I can always be that person as long as I'm not causing harm. And as long as I'm still following the values and mission of the organization that I work for. I come from a corporate background. So 
for me, like that mental barrier, I still see it a lot, even though now I work for a nonprofit, an organization that like hosts a retreat like this, but I still find myself like, oh, I shouldn't be showing up as myself because, you know, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. So it really, as you mentioned, Tekka, like is a privilege to be at an organization where this type of work is prioritized. And I know we touched a little bit on this, but could you two share a little more about why does OAESV host this retreat? Like, why is it important for more advocates to show up in the coming years? You know, you think of sexual violence work and it's like, oh, advocates should providing counseling to survivors. Like, what is this? What is this dance stuff you guys are talking about? Like, this isn't helping eradicate sexual violence. Like, what would you push back on that? But it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I have had the opportunity to be in this field for a while, and I know what it has been like to see people working their hardest on shoestring budgets and communities that don't get it and you're pushing really hard for change and you find yourself in the same situations over and over again and you go, is anything going to change? Or you have a client workload that is so intense that you're back to back because you want to serve everyone in your community, but you can't afford to have another advocate and it's just you. And that is such, it's such powerful work. It's so important. And so I think It has been such a treat to be at the state level and say, let me take this on for you. Let me host this for you. And you can just come and be yourself, be messy, be a silly goose, be whatever. And hopefully that will recharge you. And hopefully we can then start to advocate for more flexible funding, more fundraising that can then allow even like our agencies to do this themselves. You know, that way they don't have to travel so far. They don't have to rely on us. But for the time being, we are in a beautiful opportunity to find ways to flexibly do this. And so for the meantime, let us hold this container for you so that you can send your staff. That way, all of it is important. Yeah, I was just thinking last year, this is before Natasha came on staff, I was working with Elle, and when we arrived at Mohican, they said to me, what can I do to help? And I said, nothing. I don't, I don't want you to do anything, right? I want you to be a part of what's going on. And it took them a while to kind of like let that go because the assignment was that they were supposed to be there to help. And I was like, no, I don't want you to. So the only thing we want the advocates to do or people working in that space, anti-violence space, is to show up because this work is hard. This work attracts people who want to help. And when there are shoestring budgets, they are the type of people that will say, I'll do it. I'll work extra, right? I'll wear 20 different hats right? Because they believe in what they're doing and they want to cause less harm and less suffering. You know, these retreats are so important for them to come and just, (sighs) and then be witnessed in the fact that we know this work is hard. And then also learn where there's a boundary between you and your work right? Some of our advocates still, or some of the people working in the space still don't know it's, it's, it's all gas and no brakes, right? And so we're also like modeling, like, yeah, there has to be this space between what you do in order for you to show up in your most fullest resource self. You're no good to the collective when you're all burnt out. Because now we've lost you forever. Like <laughs> Yes. And and you have so much to give, but we don't we don't want you to give it all at once. And so the self-care retreat is is modeling all of these things, plus providing an opportunity for some resourcing at the same time. And I'd make the argument too, if you're gonna take some of the skills that you've learned and there's gonna be a transference to the people that you support and work with, that the survivors that you see every day. You know, we had workshops on sound bath and guided meditation. And some of our advocates were like, I've never heard of that before. Let me experience this myself. And so when they go back, this is another tool in their toolbox as they're helping folks process trauma and they're looking for some sort of relief. They can say, have you ever heard of 
sound baths, this is something, and this was my experience. It's something that you could try as well. You know, it, so it literally adds like other resources for them to share to survivors. So that's my argument for us to keep doing it as well, is that it literally just keeps adding more tools to the toolbox. Yes. Something that you mentioned, Tekka, was this difficulty in knowing when work stops. And I think a big part of that is because the title of advocate is a job description, but also people who don't work in this field call themselves advocates all the time. So like you can be an advocate in your personal life, but then you're also an advocate in your professional life. And then it's like, you're just 24 seven advocate (laughs) and the cycle keeps going and going and going. So yeah, I think having this opportunity to pause and look outside of that and realize that you are so many other things outside of that and also an advocate. Are there plans to keep pursuing this as a yearly venture? That's my goal, at least. As long as I'm working for the Alliance, uh, you know, my title is Director of Training and Member Engagement. And to me, this was engagement. We were not only able to engage with centers that we don't see very often, we got to be in person, and then other folks got to engage with each other. And so based off of my title alone, I will be advocating for it very strongly. So hopefully the goal will be is to keep this as part of our annual calendar that we release It may be hosted at different times. I know some of the feedback was that the two-day format was absolutely needed. So trying to make sure that we have a flexible enough budget that we can make that not a barrier, because I think that that was also what allowed people to just show up. So that is absolutely my goal. 2025, here we go. I always say that I'm like a a part of the family, right? (laughs) Yes, you definitely are. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Okay, so... This is one of the communities that I love showing up in. I just feel like I'm when I show up, like it's it feels like I'm coming home, right? And so as a cousin, <laughs> I just hope that this continues to also, not because of all of the benefits that we talked about, but again, I'm going to say this, I think it's the third time that this is best practice, right? This is a best practice that needs to be highlighted at national conferences and that we, you know, that hopefully people will want to benchmark with us and see how we are doing this and how are we getting it done? How are we, you know, how are we allocating the finances and how are we bringing people to this retreat? How has it grown? And, you know, all of those things, um, because then that even makes us a bigger collective of people who are doing this work across the country, right? So then we our ecosystem grows when we can share this type of information. So catch Natasha at the National Sexual Assault Conference next year with a workshop on self-care retreats. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a lot to learn and grow in the aspect of designing these or doing these. And I don't even know if it would even be me. But as long as I'm here, I will continue to voice the importance of it. We are also very blessed. The places that we've gone are all part of the Ohio Department of Uh, natural resources. So we had Mohican Lodge, we had Deer Creek Lodge. So we had people who said, wow, I think I'm going to take my family here for vacation. So there's even a mutual benefit of like tourism for the state and things like that. So truly would love to see us continue to grow in this. And we got really great feedback. And there are things that we know we'll keep and things that we would want to like adjust and change and just keep it getting better from there. I love that. I love that feedback was given and that this can be a space we all are building together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So before I pressed record, Natasha joked that she has a long list of people she'd like to thank. So I'm giving you a moment to have your like Golden Globes thank you speech. (laughs) Thank you so much, Laura. Yes. Let me waterfall gratitude with the amazing people who made this event happen. So I mentioned it before, but I really want to say special thanks to Deer Creek Lodge and Conference Center. They allowed us all to descend 55 of us onto their facility uh, and were gracious in holding that space, having the rooms, making sure that we had a beautiful bonfire to have s'mores and things like that. So thank you so much to Deer Creek Lodge. Thank you so much to every single one of our facilitators who showed up and did workshops. We had Tekka Thompson, Jen Ida Miller, Sharonda Chrome, Lawrence Green, 
Bryn Hendrickson, Jennifer Ajwa, Charmaine Bias, Candice I. Gilla K., Sherelle Brown, Sarah Ferrato, Shelby Lieber, and Jacinta Bunnell. And then we had two amazing sponsors. We didn't talk about this too much, but one of the things that also lended to the collectiveness is we had a community care table. And so on that was resources for anyone to take. Did you need a blanket to do yoga in the morning? Do you need bug spray to go deep in the woods with Sarah? Do you need other harm reduction supplies for yourself or your clients? And so two beautiful sponsors were the Columbus Public Health Sexual Health and Wellness Center and the SOAR Initiative, who provided us materials that people were able to take for themselves and for others. So that was my beautiful long list of people that I wanted to thank. And really all of the OAESV staff that allowed me to take some time to plan this event. This was a little bit extra on top of my workload, but I did not mind, truly. I felt the collectiveness of my staff. I just want to thank Natasha. Like, <laughs> really created such a beautiful container uh, for all of us and made it look so easy. And on the back end, I know that to not be true. Like there's a lot that goes on, but she was holding the space beautifully and created such a beautiful framework for all of us to come and take what we need. Um, and so just kudos and shout out, lifting you up for all of the work that you did, because I know personally what it takes and sometimes a little hard to drop into the care because you you have so much in your mind, but you did an amazing job and I am so grateful to you. Thank you, Tech. Tekka also did a very beautiful like five minute thing that I was not expecting. And then everyone came and hugged me and I was a little emotional, not gonna lie, I hid behind a door. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm supposed to be invisible. Don't, don't mind me. But it was it was fun and I was able to take part in the care while also just making sure that I was doing my due diligence and that everyone had what they need. Friday at 5 p.m. I did collapse. <laughs> and then we were able to rest for the weekend because that that was not my job in that moment. It was to make sure everyone was cared for. Yes, I was just going to say, I hope that even though you were the facilitator, I hope that you were able to still partake in some of the activities. And as we wrap up, I just wanted to give you guys the floor to share just one one takeaway you're, that you're taking away personally about your own experience at the event. For me, I'm going to say um, that the takeaway was that the collective is powerful because I just really honestly got to be in the collective and be taken care of because when I showed up, I had significant grief. And um, I, there was a moment when I was like, okay, I always knew I was coming, but am I going to show up in my fullest self or am I going to just kind of, you know, rest in my laurels and just kind of be? And I was able to show up 100% fully, not because of, of my own strength, but because of the way the collective held me throughout the whole entire retreat. So the collective is powerful when we lean into it. I don't think I could say it any better myself. No, that was perfect. <laughs> so I'm sure everyone listening to this episode is thinking, get me on the list. How can I come next year and be a part of this beautiful experience? Lori, that's a great question. I think really this is an opportunity that we can host for any of our members, um, particularly rape crisis centers. But truly, if you are a member of our collective, you should be allowed to have this experience of rest and joy. And so we really hope that you can become a member of OAESV. If you visit on our website, there's information about how you become a member. A lot of our benefits are training, technical assistance. So if you're working with survivors directly, whether that's as a rape crisis center or in a non-traditional way, we have lots of counseling and lots of other folks who come and we would really benefit as that collective voice to have you as a member. So please come check us out and we hope to see you as a member of OAESV. I will put the link in the description, but the short link is just oaesv.org slash membership. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Tekka, for having this conversation with me today. I still gleamed amazing knowledge and wisdom and hope um, just from having this discussion. So thank you for having it with me. And I will be there next year. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to Teal Talk. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into intersectional issues affecting survivors in Ohio. If you like what you heard, subscribe and leave us a five-star rating and review, recommend us to a friend, and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at OAESV and Twitter at Ohio Alliance ESV. If you'd like to learn more about us and the services we offer, sign up for our email list or read a transcript of this episode, visit oaesv.org. Want to share a comment or ask a question for a future episode? Just click on the link in the show notes to leave us a voicemail. And remember, we're here to help. Feel free to call our resource line at 888-886-8388 during regular business hours or the Ohio Sexual Violence Helpline 24-7 at 844-644-6435. See you next time.